welcome to the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame Induction Banquet. Live from Amarillo, here's your host, Jason Jackson. And it's my sincere pleasure to welcome each and every one of you, of course, to the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame Induction Banquet, underwritten by the Amarillo Convention and Visitors Bureau. We hope that you have enjoyed the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame induction and reunion celebration as well, underwritten by the Eamon Carter Foundation so far. We have a wonderful evening ahead of us tonight, so to continue our honor of the legends of our industry. Kind, compassionate, dedicated. These words undoubtedly describe this year's recipient of the Merle Wood Humanitarian Award, Sandy Hebner. A longtime AQHA exhibitor, Sandy has been involved with the equine industry for more than 50 years. Her show career introduced her to a passion for horses, but her involvement in local shows opened the door for her passion to serve others. In 2009, Sandy became a volunteer for Treehouse of Greater St. Louis, an organization that strives to improve the lives of individuals with disabilities and their families through therapy, recreation, education, and exploration using equine-assisted therapy. In 2010, she helped host a clinic at the March to the Arch Charity Horse Show for equestrians with disabilities to experience the horse and what a horse show had to offer. Over the years, Sandy has worked tirelessly to provide programs and activities for EWD riders, military personnel, and Special Olympic equestrians, which allows her to bring the love of the horse to those who may not otherwise get to experience it. Sandy succeeded in instituting the Special Olympics Equestrian Team Accreditation for Treehouse and other Missouri Therapeutic Riding Centers. She also served as the head Special Olympics coach for the Treehouse and continues to work with riders to prepare them to participate in Special Olympics Equestrian Team classes. Sandy worked with the co-founder of Treehouse to form the Freedom Reigns program designed to use equine assisted therapy for active and retired military personnel. Sandy serves as an example of putting others before oneself. She has devoted her time, expertise, and passion toward others through providing opportunities to experience riding an American Quarter Horse. A love for the horse and a love for people, Sandy Hebner was able to bring her two passions together to serve others in the process. Congratulations, Sandy Hebner, the 2019 recipient of the prestigious Merle Wood Humanitarian Award. The 2020 Merle Wood Humanitarian Award recipient is Gail Mann of CO Oregon. Gail has shaped thousands of young equestrians with her knowledge, expertise, and generosity. A longtime AQHA member, Gail has been involved with the equine industry for more than 50 years. Her showing career kickstarted her passion for the industry, but she soon recognized a need for equine education in her community. Her desire to share her passion with others sparked her true mission, to educate others about American Quarter Horses and serve her community. For almost 50 years, Gail has supported the Oregon 4-H Horse Program. She was a 4-H club leader for more than 45 years and spent 49 years as judge, retiring in 2018. The gifts of her time and knowledge have reached thousands of children over the years. Gail also developed a curriculum to help educate horse owners through classes at several community colleges in her area. Over the years, Gail has taught and coached youth in the arena. She successfully established a local horse show to raise money for the County 4-H program and has attended state house hearings to raise awareness about the benefits of 4-H. Gail has worked tirelessly to help youth succeed in the equine industry. She and her husband, Mike, have offered their time, facilities, and even horses to those in need. Gail's dedication to the American Quarter Horse and the industry are evident in her involvement in a number of capacities within the Oregon Quarter Horse Association. The Manns were recognized as 50-year American Quarter Horse Association breeders in 2018. Gail represents what it truly means to be selfless and compassionate. She's not focused on awards, accolades, or compensation, but rather helping to raise the next generation of quality horsemen and women who can positively impact the industry. Gail's wealth of knowledge and passion for helping others have made her a youth equine industry leader and someone whom others can count on for advice and education. 
Upon her retirement, hundreds of people shared their stories of how Gail impacted their lives and equestrian careers, a true testament to the lives she has touched. Congratulations, Gail Mann, the 2020 Merle Wood Humanitarian Award recipient. Welcome Gail Mann to the stage. Please keep nurturing our 4 H'ers, our future farmers, our youth activities, and for those of you that are out there, think about our people that are the wannabes in our world. They, they look up to us, we're a tremendous organization. Please keep nurturing them. Thank you. Congratulations, Gail, once again. Let's go ahead and begin our Hall of Fame inductions. We've waited patiently, uh, waiting to pay tribute to these representatives in person. And tonight, we are honored not only to induct them into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame, but also we get to share their stories with you all and the individuals watching at home as well. In 1982, the AQHA convention in Anaheim, California, the first two inductees were honored. They were er J. Ernest Browning of Arizona and Robert M. Denhart of California. In the past 39 years, 317 outstanding women, men, and horses have been honored in the AQHA Hall of Fame, and thousands of visitors from around the world get to learn about the contributions of these inductees when they visit the American Corridors Hall of Fame and Museum right here in Amarillo. Hall of Fame members are also displayed, of course, on the AQHA's website. Being inducted into the American Corridors Hall of Fame is the highest honor bestowed on both humans and our loved horses. The inductees have shaped our breed into the largest breed registry and the most versatile horse in the world. Through their talent, their hard work, their dedication, sometimes luck, and they all have a story to tell. The six equine inductees achieved a success in the show ring and on the racetrack and have made legendary and significant impacts on the American quarter horse industry. We'll also get to honor tonight five individuals whose horsemanship their ability to spot greatness, their leadership has touched so many lives and horses and humans while shaping the industry and blazing the trail for the lifestyle as we know it. We hope you all enjoy visiting the American Quarter Hall of Fame this weekend and get to see where tonight's inductees fit in the timeline of our great history. If you haven't had the chance to visit, I encourage you to do so immediately. Now, let's meet the class of 2020. Tonight, we get to begin with a good machine. If it were possible for a horse to be born into the Hall of Fame, a good machine would be as close as it gets. Fold in Illinois on March 4th, 1993, the Bay Colt was bred by Don Schroeder of Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. He is a son of Hall of Fame stallion Zippo's Mr. Goodbar, whose Hall of Fame sire, Zippo Pine Bar, is by Hall of Famer Zippo Pat Bars. The dam of Zippo's Mr. Goodbar is a daughter of Hall of Fame sire Blondie Stude, and that's just on his sire side. A Good Machine is one of nine performers from 11 foals out of the War Machine mare War Kelpie. War Machine was the son of the Hall of Fame thoroughbred stallion Top Deck and out of Law Machine, a maternal granddaughter of racing champion sire Flying Bob. War Kelpie produced the earners of more than 800 AQHA points, including ROM performers A Good Machine, his full siblings A Good Revelation and Too Good to Believe, and his half-brother Blazing Tradition, a gelding by Blazing Hot. Richard Rick McDonald, who stood the stallion at his MC Equine Enterprise LLC in Whitesboro, Texas, says, Mac was a big horse, 16-1 and probably weighed between 1,250 and 1,300 pounds. He had lots of confirmation, very strong, very eloquent looking, just had tons of ability for as big as he was. He could go very slow for a horse his size. It was incredible. A good machine carried John Dean in the saddle at the 1995 AQHA World Show and was a top 10 finalist in the two-year-old Snafflebit Futurity. At the All-American Quarter Horse Congress, he earned the reserve champion title in the same class. 
They went on to earn the Stallion his Superior Award in Western Pleasure, were third in the Congress Junior Western Pleasure in 1996, and finished in the top 10 in Junior Western Pleasure at both the 1996 and 1997 World Shows. Mac was an easy horse to train and show, says John, who showed the horse for Dr. Ronald Nicholas before eventually buying him. When I first got him as a two-year-old, he had been ridden maybe 30 times. Mac was really just a natural horse, an easy horse to train, an excellent loper right from the start. A good machine's foals carry his capabilities and athleticism. His confirmation, athleticism, and disposition are seen in his progeny today. Mac crossed so well with so many different types of horses, Rick says. They did the English, they did the Western, they did trail, Western riding halter. There really wasn't anything he didn't cross with. He didn't have one perfect nick. He had a good nick with everything. A good machine built success into his foal's DNA, but also gave his humans a lot of success. In my opinion, a good machine was a really, really good individual, John says. But what he produced is the biggest deal. A sire that produces excellent babies that win in the show pen is a good horse. But when a sire produces some of the hottest stallions right now, like Machine Made and others, that's what makes a great stallion, a Hall of Fame horse. A good machine was euthanized May 28, 2011 due to a spinal myelopathy. That horse was my pal. He really was, says Rick. A good machine was a true, true quarter horse, what our foundation was. That's why he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Durability, versatility, longevity. A good machine not only possessed those traits, but passed them down to generations of champions to follow. We welcome this great stallion and his legacy into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank AQHA and everybody on the committee uh, that voted this horse in. Uh, they got the quietest guy that ever had a hold of that horse to come up here and talk about it. I have no idea why they did such a thing as that, but the few of you that know me are laughing. Uh, I asked my buddy, Alex Ross, I said, you know, how's this go? What do you do? And he goes, well, you're going to accept the award. They're going to play a little video, and then you're going to say a few words. I'm like, like what? He said, well, you can tell a story about him or something. I said, probably the best story about this horse is how, he came, how I came to have him in the first place. He was uh, sold to a person who I became partners with in Ohio that didn't get along. A friend of mine called and said, you have room for another two-year-old? And I said, what is it? And he said, it's a good bar. And I said, is it Roan? And he said, no, it's Bay. And I said, okay, go ahead and send him down. <laughs> and... Uh, he got there, he got off the trailer, and he was long-haired. It was about the end of March in his two-year-old year, and he'd been ridden 30 days, and he was four inches too tall for me at that time. So, and he had a snotty nose. We got him well, and I told one of the guys, I said, go, go ride the big colt around and see what he is. Well, three or four days went by, and uh, so I called him, or talked to him, I said, hey, you've been riding the big colt? He goes, yeah. I said, how is he? And he goes, he's, he's, he's all right, he's pretty good, he's quiet. So we'll bring him out here and let me see him. So he brings him outside and he rides him around. He starts jogging him. I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. And so we'll lope him. So he lopes him around one way. And I said, turn him around and lope him the other way. And he lopes him the other way. And uh, needless to say, that was the last time that anybody at my house rode that horse for about the next five years. He was mine. <laughs> uh, he was good minded. He was just such a good horse. Uh, he was a good horse to train. I loved him. And he did a lot for all of us. Uh, Kim Dean did a fantastic job uh, marketing that horse. Rick loved him and, and did a good job with all the breeding the whole time we had him. And me, all I had to do was ride a nice horse around, show him, and have an in endless supply of young ones coming on every year. So I had the easiest job of the bunch. But we're very grateful. We appreciate it, and thank you. Thank you, John, and congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, let's remember the great Dual Ray. 
You can't beat the classics, and Dual Ray was certainly a classic American quarter horse. The Sorrel Stallion could do it all, with class, cow sense, speed, athleticism, and the propensity to spread it around. Bred and owned throughout his life by Linda Holmes of Holmes Cutting and Performance Horses at Longmont, Colorado, Dual Ray was by the Peppy Sand Badger Stallion, Dual Pep. Dual Ray was foaled in 1994 out of the Wyoming dock mare, Nurse Ray, who was a half-sister to the dock's lynx gelding, Ray Lynx, and the smart little Lena gelding, Smart Olena. Debuting in 1997, Dual Ray first made his name as a top-flight cutting horse at the NCHA Futurity, where Lloyd Cox rode him to a tie for sixth in the Open Finals. Dual Ray earned more than $100,000 in the show pen. Dual Ray was not a very big horse, about 14 two hands, says Linda, whose father, Jim Holmes, founded the family's horse operation in the 1970s. He had a deep heart girth. Dual Ray was really quick. He wanted to be low-headed, have that freedom of head and neck when he came through turns. He wasn't a mechanical horse. He really wanted to do it naturally. However, it was in the breeding shed that Dual Ray really made his mark. The number two leading cutting sire and a leading maternal grandsire in the National Cutting Horse Association, Dual Ray has sired offspring with earnings of more than $40 million through AQHA, NCHA, and the National Reined Cow Horse and National Reining Horse Associations. Dual Ray has sired numerous winners in barrel racing and ranch horse competitions. Additionally, he has sired 16 AQHA World Champions and 18 AQHA Reserve World Champions, as well as champions at cuttings around the world. Jewel Ray stood his first year at the Holmes' place before moving to Oswood Stallion Station in Weatherford, Texas, where he spent the last decade of his breeding career. He lived life on his own terms, so he had just worked around his stuff and he was like that till the end says Jeff Oswood, manager of Oswood Stallion Station. He was a nice horse to be around, never had an evil thought, but he was just a little different. The stallion returned to Colorado to live out the remainder of his life before being euthanized in May of 2018 due to complications of age. It was fun having him home again, Linda says. Dual Ray was like a child to me. We raised him, we raised his mother, we had his mother's sire, so they were like family. Delightful as he was, Dual Ray also had his quirks. The stallion liked people in general, but he definitely had his favorites. He was kind of an ornery little baby when we were raising him, Linda recalls. Dual Ray was real good at opening things and getting his way. He was real good at training people. That was his specialty, training people to do things his way. Like Jeff said, he lived life on his own terms, and we all knew it. Quirks and all, Dual Ray was a member of the Holmes family and made an impact that ripples across the American quarter horse industry to this day. Initially, Linda debated on sharing his foals with the world. I didn't know if I wanted to share them because I knew what they were. I knew the horses were so cowy, so fast and so athletic. They would take care of you if you just left them alone. They all have their daddy's personality, that I want to do it my way thing. The industry owes a great thanks to the Holmes family for sharing this special stallion and his progeny with our industry. We show that appreciation by inducting Dual Ray into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome AQHA past president Frank Merrill to accept on behalf of Dual Ray. Good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for your indulgence for just a few short minutes. Uh, I think it's important to point out the importance of this horse in our industry. Dual Ray today is the second all-time leading sire of performance horse earners in all disciplines, siring the earners of more than $49 million. His progeny are uh, uh, involved in cutting, reining, rain cow horse, and many other events. Those 
those associations where he is a leading sire, not only AQHA, but NCHA, NRHA, and NRCHA. To date, Dual Ray has sired 16 AQHA world champions and 18 reserve world champions. The total earnings of Dual Ray foals, maternal grand foals, and parental grand foals combined is a whopping $102 million. And we're still counting. Uh, not only is uh, that amazing, but he died in 2018, and this year he's the third leading cutting horse sire of foals so far in 2021, earning $1.4 million. I want to thank Linda Holmes and her late father, Jim, for breeding such a tremendous stallion and giving him to our industry and for the honor to accept this award on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and congratulations to Dual Ray and everybody involved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go back to the big screen as we honor the thoroughbred mare, Esther's Little Clue. Dynamite comes in small packages. Esther's Little Clue was dynamite indeed. A daughter of the Olympia Stallion Big Clue, the thoroughbred mare was bred by Dan Williams and foaled April 16, 1968 out of the eternal reward mare, Little Esther. She wasn't real big, but she was a good-looking mare, says Robert Driggers of Anthony, New Mexico. But it wasn't quarter horse confirmation or thoroughbred confirmation. You could look right at her, and if somebody told you she was a thoroughbred, you'd believe it. And if somebody told you, well, that's a quarter horse, you'd believe it. As it turned out, the dynamite mare's fuse was a little longer than expected. She went to post 26 times from 1970 through 1972, returning with one win, two seconds, one third, and more than 1,600 in earnings. There was enough dynamite left over for her to share with her offspring. Bred to 12 different stallions, Esther's Little Clue produced 15 American Quarter Horse foals that earned more than $230,000 on the track. One of her best was her first, the bunny bid mare, Esther's Bunny, who was foaled in 1973. As a six-year-old, Esther's Bunny produced the Jet Creek mare, Splashing Bunny, who when crossed on six fortunes, became the dam of Splashing Fortune. Bred to Stoli, Splashing Fortune produced Stoli's Fortune. When bred to Tress Sace, she became the dam of the richest quarter horse in history, Champion Ochoa, who was foaled in 2009 and went on to earn more than $2.7 million on the track. In 1985, Robert and his wife Del Rey bought the mare at the Heritage Place Fall Mix Sale from E.L. Weber of Anadarko, Oklahoma. We had seen some of her colts run and we were familiar with one of her daughters that produced runners, he says. They were all running in Oklahoma very early in the year as two-year-olds and they were all really fast. The Driggers were not the only people to notice her. You know how you just get the feeling about something? asks American Quarter Horse Hall of Famer Ben Hudson, the owner, publisher, and editor of Track Magazine. That was her. There wasn't anything particularly outstanding about her. She was no great looker or anything, but I just had the feeling that she was the real deal. I had seen her at Mr. Weber's place in Oklahoma, and she had already had a flaming jet gelding that had won $40,000 and a real thing filly that had won $63,000, which was a lot of money back in those days. So I went over to that sale in Oklahoma City thinking I might get her bought for less than $5,000. But this cowboy from New Mexico had a different idea, and obviously more money. I went back to the stall where she was, and there was Robert Driggers, standing there looking at her. In addition to Ochoa, Esther's Little Clue was the source of champions feature Mr. Bojangles, 6 to 5, Jumping Tack Flash, Splash Back, and Carter's Cartel. She is also the source of top runners like Gun Battle, Tack It Like a Man, and Flash First, among many others. None of this would have happened had I bought Esther's Little Clue, Ben admits. Robert Driggers, a true horseman, bought her. Her family gave him another graded stakes winner in 2018. Esther's Little Clue died in June 1995. Esther's Little Clue most definitely belongs in the Hall of Fame, says Ben, and we agree. The dynamite mare who drew the attention of many 
Esther's Little Clue now joins the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Driggers to the stage to accept on behalf of Esther's Little Clue. Good evening. <clears throat> First, I would like to thank the HQHA for offering, honoring our mayor, Esther Little Clue, and to congratulate all of the fellow inductees. This is such a great honor for all of those who have dedicated our lives to the industry, or in this case, the horses who have left their mark on the breed. I grew up on the Barbary Ranch in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, and developed my passion for horses for my father. He had a love for the American Quarter Horse, and as a young boy, I was fortunate enough to be around great horses like Billy Clay, Greyhound, and some others on our ranch. We bred horses that we used on the ranch and at rodeos. But my father, he truly loved a fast horse, and he spent a lot of time at the racetrack. He did, he did love to bet the horses, I'll tell you, he did. I don't think in his wildest dream, though, he would have ever predicted this moment. And I know for sure he would have been very proud. <clears throat> My wife, Del Rey, has been obsessed with horses probably since she could walk. Having grown up of modest means, they could not afford horses. And she would walk miles every day to ride a neighboring farm's, farmer's horse, sometimes without permission. Our combined love for America's fastest athlete left us in constant search for the best mares for the job. And it was the purchase of Esther's little clue, who we affectionately called Grandma, that was the beginning of our life's journey. And she became, she became <clears throat> more than we could have hoped for. We are proud that she is the taproot mare that is responsible for so many outstanding horses, including world champions from both the racetrack and the arena. <clears throat> Over the years, we have been blessed to raise several nice horses because of Grandma, such as AQHA Champion 6 to 5, and World Champion Junior Barrel Horse FM Radio. And because of her, we have personally had the opportunity twice to run for the elusive million in the Grade 1 All American, with Major Rhyme running third and Gun Battle finishing second. And Grandma was the third dam of both of these horses, and we raised both of these horses, proud to say, and we raised their mothers. We are still working on trying to win that thing, though. Anyway, uh, none of it would have been possible without none of the memories, highs and lows, victories and defeats. <clears throat> Every one of us is sitting here and experienced in the horse industry would have been possible for us without Esther's little clue. We want to thank everyone who have invested in them through breeding, purchasing, training, and racing. She would not have had the opportunity to, re to be recognized here tonight. There is no way for us to fully express our genuine gratitude to everyone who is a hand in our success story, or to those who wrote letters to the Hall of Fame on committee on her behalf, but we, we humbly, humbly thank you. Such is the honor, honor for a mayor that was full of spunk and spice and not very nice, and she was not very nice at times. But it was that grit that that mayor passed on through her get through the, in the decades that is still producing winners today. One person that has contributed to the achievements of Grandma's produce is Hall of Famer inductee, my friend Sleepy Gilbert. Over the years, he has trained several horses out of this female family, but it was Johnny T.L. Jones that sent him the best one. AQHA's number one money earner and world champion Ochoa. It is fitting that Sleepy is being inducted tonight 
and congratulations on your induction and thank you for your hard work over the years as well as your friendship. This is much deserved honor for you and your team. Before I wrap this up, I need to thank one more person, Ben Hudson. Ben, thank you for not raising your hand one more time at that heritage sale all those years ago. We are glad to be the ones that got to take Esther's little clue home. That being said, surprisingly, not surprisingly, you and Christine have raised a lot of exceptional runners over the years without her. I guess you could say that the love of a good horse is what brought my wife and myself together many years ago, and it's what is, keeps us going now and what has brought us here tonight to celebrate. God bless, God bless the broodmares. Thank you, Robert, and congratulations to Esther's little clue. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we honor Mr. Eye Opener. Everyone knows what April 1st is, the day Mr. Eye Opener was born. He may have been born on April Fool's Day, but don't let his size fool you. Breeder Joe Kirk Fulton of Lubbock, Texas, told American Quarter Horse Hall of Famer Ben Hudson of Track Magazine, he'll do something. Fold in 1990 on the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame Horseman's Ranch at Ledbetter, Texas, the Gray Colt by Dash for Cash was from the program that produced champions from Peppy Sandbadger to Dash's Dream and Special Leader. Mr. Eye Opener was one of five stakes horses out of Bedouin, a daughter of Beduino, who produced the earners of more than $600,000, including grade one winner Daring Difference, and the stakes placed full siblings, Miss Eye Opener and Cash Tree. Mr. Eye Opener was a great horse, says Jack Brooks, the Hall of Fame trainer who conditioned the colt. I bought him for Mr. Smith for $30,000 at the All-American Yearling Sale. He wasn't real big, kind of small in fact, Blaine Schvonevelt told me. I can't believe you bought that little old horse, but they all came around to my way of thinking later. Mr. Eye Opener's performance on the track was enough to convince anyone who saw him compete that he was a champion. As a two-year-old on his second out, Mr. Eye Opener clocked a track record 16.45 seconds at 330 yards in the West Texas Futurity on March 21st at Sunland Park in New Mexico. He would place in both the Grade 1 Kansas and Rainbow Futurities at Rio Dosa Downs and that fall won the Speed Horse Gold and Silver Cup Futurity at Trinity Meadows in Texas. The following year, Mr. Eye Opener ran in the final of the Speed Horse Gold and Silver Cup Derby and left the track with earnings of more than $200,000 and a record of nine wins, two seconds, and a third from 15 starts. Mr. Eye Opener was real nice to ride, says Kenny Hart, who was in the irons for the West Texas Futurity. He wasn't a real big horse, but he was quick. And of course, like all of Jack Brooks' horses, when he got to the racetrack, he was broke. The little horse didn't make any mistakes. He would walk in that gate, and when they opened it, he went to the other end. When the Smiths were ready to put Mr. Eye Opener to stud, they chose D and Betty Raper's Belmere Farm at Norman, Oklahoma, where he became a top 10 leading sire. He was a great stallion, easy to handle, no problems, says Betty. We had some great years with him. As a matter of fact, Belmere Farms was put in the Oklahoma Quarter Horse Hall of Fame in 2019, and we basically owe it all to Mr. Eye Opener. Mr. Eye Opener sired nearly 1,500 starters for more than 2,000 foals, including 95 stakes winners, 849 other winners, and the earners of more than $28.2 million. At more than $1.3 million, his leading money earner is champion Isa Special. Jack Brooks sent out Isa Special under Jackie Martin to score in the 2000 All-American Futurity, while Mr. Eye Opener Colt Eye on Pay Dirt also lit the board. He also sired Rock's Eye Opener, who was the 2009 AQHA Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association Steer Wrestling Horse of the Year in 2009 with Lee Graves and Trevor Knowles. When AQHA closed the books in 2018, Mr. Eye Opener ranked number 10 on the all-time leading sires of money earners list at more than $28 million. The only son of Dash for Cash that ranked higher was First Down Dash. Mr. Eye Opener died November 18, 2018. 
He was such a blessing to our family, says Chris Bayer, whose father, Jim Smith, acquired Mr. Eye Opener in 2003 upon the death of his father, Dale Smith. Mr. Eye Opener brought us all together. We'd all go to Rio Doso or wherever he was to watch him run. That was three generations, my grandfather, my father, my family, and my sister's family. Three generations. It was so much fun. Mr. Eye Opener rightfully takes his place in the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame as a competitor, sire, and an example to all to not let size fool you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chris Bear to accept on behalf of Mr. Eye Opener. Okay, this is it. My name is Chris Bear, and I'm very honored to be here, along with my husband Jeff, my sister Lisa, and her three children, Brett, Matt, Nicole, and Brett's fiance, Dana. We're, we're all here to accept this award. My grandparents, Dale and Billy Smith, loved horses, and they loved racing. My grandfather owned horses his entire life, but I think Mr. Eyeopener, Mr. Eyeopener was by far his favorite. Back in 1992, my grandpa knew in his heart that Mr. Eye Opener had the chance to be something special. So he and my dad flew to El Paso to go to the West Texas fraternity. I can still remember their excitement when they got home. And for good reason, Mr. Eye Opener not only won the fraternity, but he set a speed record. They had really great expectations for him from then on. That summer, our entire family went to the trials and the Triple Crown races. We made so many fond memories, and it really brought our family together. The next season, Mr. Eye Opener ran as a three-year-old, and once again, we, we rejoiced in his many victories. From there, Eye Opener retired to Belmare Farms, which is near Norman, Oklahoma. My parents, Jim and Dorothy, went to see him often because he had become such an important part of their life. I would like to thank Betty and her late husband, Dee Raper, who are the owners of Belmare Farms, for taking such good care of Mr. Eye Opener. Our family is also forever grateful to Jack Brooks for all he did to make him a champion. He was a great trainer. Finally, on behalf of our family, thank you to the American Quarter Horse Association for placing Mr. Eye Opener into the Hall of Fame where his legacy can live on. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and congratulations to Mr. Eye Opener as well. Ladies and gentlemen, we go back to the big screens, and next we get to honor Triple's image. Bred, born, raised, and shown to be a great horse, Triple's image is remembered as one of the best stallions in the United States. He was bred to be a runner, but he was so good looking his original owners decided not to race him, said Professor Emeritus Lee Petty, who retired after 35 years as equine director and instructor of equine science at Mount San Antonio College in Walnut, California. Bred by Walter L. Clark of Forsyth, Montana, Triple's image was a sorrel son of Triple Chick, one of the very best sons of three bars, the first thoroughbred inducted into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Triple Chick was out of racing champion Chickadoo V, a Hall of Fame daughter of Chicaro Bill, and the Hall of Fame mayor, Do Good. Do Good was the St. Louis Distaffer, who was the foundation brood mayor for Vessel Stallion Farm. Triple's image was out of foot, whose sire, Leo, also is a Hall of Famer, and whose dam was a granddaughter of Hall of Fame foundation sire, Joe Hancock. Foot foaled her sorrel colt in Oklahoma on April 22, 1969 sold at three months of age to Lee Alexander and Ed Anchel of Newton, New Jersey, he originally was meant to be registered under the name Triple Quick. Before the papers went through at AQHA, however, he was taken to his first show in Columbus, Ohio, where, as an unnamed weanling in the All-American Quarter Horse Congress, he displayed the tremendous confirmation of his sire. 
When he left the ring as champion Wien Ling Colt, his new owners decided Triple's image was a more suitable name. His Congress debut led to a series of wins for a number of owners in a half dozen states. Shown 29 times as a yearling, usually by Jerry Wells, Triple's image stood first in 26 classes, Grand Champion Stallion twice and Reserve 11 times. He finished the year as the industry's leading yearling stallion. The stallion was last shown in 1980, five years after becoming an AQHA champion. With a career total of 55 grands, 37 reserves, the stallion exited the circuit with lifetime totals of 99 halter and 42 performance points, including 34 in Western Pleasure, 5 in Western Riding, and 3 in Hunt Seat. The true test of a great stallion is measured by his progeny's success, and here Triple's image dominated once more. His time at the breeding shed produced 986 American quarter horses, including eight world champions, eight reserve world champions, 10 AQHA champions, 17 superior halter horses, 74 superior performance horses, and 174 ROM earners in all divisions. Altogether, those horses earned nearly 3,000 halter points and more than 12,000 performance points. Triple's image dominated outside of AQHA as well. The stallion sired 13 world champions in the American Paint Horse Association, money earners in the National Cutting Horse Association, and winners in other realms such as the National Snafflebit and International Buckskin Horse Associations, as well as the Palomino Horse Breeders of America. Triple's image was a perfect gentleman, in the breeding shed and in the barn, said AQHA past president Sandy Arledge, who stood Triple's image for three years. I had him at the end of his career and then donated him to Mount San Antonio College on behalf of his owner, Jack Strong, a state senator in Texas. Triple's image was euthanized June 28, 1999 due to kidney failure. The stallion was buried on the horse unit at Mount San Antonio College where he spent the last five years of his life. Triple's image remains forever in the hearts of those who cared for him and is now memorialized in the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Lee, Mr. Lee Petty to accept on behalf of Triple's Image. Thank you very much. Uh, as they said, my name's Lee Petty, and I <coughs> it was the equine professor and ran the horse unit at Mount San Antonio College. Most of you never sounds like a Texas college, but it's in Southern California. It's an ag school. In fact, uh, I, I need to mention that in 2018, the school was uh, honored with a 50-year breeding of quarter horses. So we've had them for a long time, and we certainly appreciate the fact that they uh, they are a great breed. I had a lot of sp my speech prepared because I didn't know, but it, it, most all of it was uh, given in the presentation there, so I'm going to uh, revamp it real quickly to keep it shorter. Uh, one thing I would like to say, if you look at his pedigree, if you look at his registration papers, you'll see that his mother's name was P-H-F-F-F-T, and just like the person that uh, uh, talked about it, I always thought it was fit. And so I thought, wow, this must have been a mare that was probably as a weanling, just a little, little crazy and, you know, threw fits all the time when you were halter breaking. But I came to find out the real story. Uh, W.A. Crone, who owned uh, his mother, Triple Image mother, during World War II got a break and went to New York. And there in New York was the Broadway play P-H-F-F-T. And it's a French word that's pronounced pouffet. So from now on, you can call it Buffet, I always called it fit. But that's the story of how that mayor got her name, and it's such an unusual name. So I thought that was worth uh, mentioning. Uh, Triple's image, as you can see, was a great horse. Uh, let me just talk about how he came about to Mount San Antonio College a little bit. <clears throat> In, when Jerry Vauder bought him uh, and brought him to California, at his very first show, in Tustin, California on January the 6th, he was, and the picture was, was there of him winning. He was grand champion stallion. And I happened to be there. I had just joined the college, and I had one of my own personal mares that I was showing at Halter. And I saw him, and I said, wow, now there is a stallion. I really loved 
alder horses. And so uh, I ended up breeding one of my own personal mares to him the next year and got a real nice cold out of him. I followed him a little bit. Jerry, his, his breeding fee went up drastically, and I couldn't afford to breed another mare to him. But nonetheless, uh, Jerry promoted him very well. And finally, uh, though Jerry didn't want to, he ended up selling him to the Circle C Ranch here in Texas because they offered him too much money and he couldn't refuse it. So I lost track of him for quite a while. Uh, finally, um, Jack Strong got him, uh, as was mentioned in the video, and brought him back to Texas. And a good friend that I've learned to really appreciate, uh, Ray Wigner, ended up leasing him. And I want to mention Ray and, and because he leased him for six years, so he doesn't show up on his registration papers at all. But he, uh, he did a tremendous job with that horse up in Washington. In fact, the horse triples that you saw in the video was bred when he was there at, Lee, at Ray's place. And so finally, after uh, a while, Ray um, gave up the, the lease on him, and Sandy got him, Sandy Arledge, who was a great friend of the college. And uh, she had donated uh, breedings to our college mayors, Bar Mesa, and some other great stallions that she stood there in Southern California. And so as soon as I saw Sandy advertise him uh, that he was back in Southern California, I directly immediately went to her place and said, Sandy, is there any way we could get a breeding to triples image to the college? And so she said, well, I think so. Let me just check with Jack, because you know how leases work. They are a, they're kind of a partnership. And so she, she called me back and said, yes, yes, you can. So I took our best mare down there to Sandy's place in, in uh, uh, Rancho San Fe. And anyway, uh, bred, uh, bred our best mare to him and got a filly. And, uh, and darn it, I was upset because I wanted a colt to be our junior stallion there from Triple Zimmage there at the school. Well, I talked to Sandy, and she said, you know what, I'm trying to get some daughters of Triple's image, and she said, would you want to trade your filly for my best colt? And I said, you betcha, that's great. So I did. Well, by this time, Triple's image was 25 years old. His semen quality was going down, as all of you breeders know, when they, with age. And um, so she called me up and said, would you like, to, would the school like to own Triple's image to kind of let him spend his last years there at the college? And I said, you bet, we would love to have him. So that's how the college got him from 1995 until he passed away. Now, once we got him, we had his semen checked for you breeders. His motility was 35%. He had 70% bent tail spinners, and some of you know what that means. So again, it wasn't real good, but to uh, make a long story short, we got foals out of him every single year. He passed, he was, uh, as you saw there, we celebrated his 30th birthday, April 22nd, 1999. And uh, unfortunately, two months later, he passed away there from kidney failure. And the other interesting note is that, that happened to be on my birthday. But he was buried there on campus, so uh, we again just thought a tremendous amount of that stallion. His, his last foals were born the next year. So at, tw at uh, 30 years of age, he actually sired some foals and they were born in the year 2000. So uh, that's kind of my history of Triple's image, a great stallion. I've loved him since the first minute I laid eyes on him. <clears throat> I've always considered him a great thing. One last thing, I know one of the things that Jerry Vauder was most proud of is Triple's image won the Get a Sire class there on the West Coast 10 out of 11 times. One of them was at the Cow Palace, and, and that was a big class of Get a Sire, and he was really proud of that and told me that, that that was one of the things he really appreciated out of Triple's, that he could win those Get a Sire classes. So again, it's an honor to have him here in the Hall of Fame, and I thank you, but thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Lee, and congratulations once again to Triple's Image. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we honor Zanpar Jack. Like father, like son, Zanpar Jack joins his sire in the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Bred by Gerald A. Ryman of Dighton, Kansas, the sorrel son of Zanpar Bar was foaled April 1, 1979. Zanpar Jack is one of three performers from 12 foals out of the two-eyed Jack mare, Miss Goldie Jack. Zanpar Jack was purchased as a two-year-old by American Quarter Horse Hall of Famer Carol Rose, who owned his sire. Carol sent Zanpar Jack, also known as Jack, to Billy Allen, 
the Hall of Fame horseman who had trained and showed sire Zan Parbar to three AQHA halter championship titles and multiple top ten finishes in heading and healing. The talented and versatile Zanpar Jack took after his sire, winning a 1983 AQHA Junior Working Cow Horse World Championship, top 10 finish in junior reigning, and high point and reserve high point titles in team roping. Billy also completed the horse's superior in heading. Jack was a willing horse and had a lot of ability, Billy says. I had a little problem hauling him at first. He thought he was the king of the crowd and acted a little study. But after a few miles on the road, he settled down. He was like his dad. He wanted to work. He loved to work. In 1984, Ed Gaylord purchased Zanpar Jack and brought him to his Lazy E Ranch in Guthrie, Oklahoma. He turned him over to AQHA professional horsemen John Miller and J.D. Yates for further training and competition. The horse was a winner, a complete winner, says J.D., who rode Jack to the AQHA Senior Healing World title in 1984 and 1985, also to top 10 placings in senior working cow horse and tie-down roping. I was fortunate enough to ride him and show him, in healing and calf roping mainly. I didn't have to do all that much. Jack let me show him. He let me win on him. The horse made a winner of his owner, too. In 1987, Ed rode Jack to the AQHA World Championship in amateur healing. In a show career that lasted through 1989, Zanpar Jack earned multiple high point awards, top 10 finishes at the AQHA World Show, superiors in both heading and healing, open and amateur registers of merit, and 628 AQHA points. Without a doubt, he was the horse of a lifetime, Ed says. Zanpar Jack sired 347 American Quarter Horses, with 117 of them earning more than 19,000 AQHA points, including 131 registers of merit. Two of his most notable offspring were daughters Bar J. Jackie, foaled in 1986, who won the AQHA World Championships in senior heading and healing and an all-around high point title. She later produced AQHA Super Horse Popular Resort figure. Another was 1991 Mayor Jackie 11, who earned four AQHA championships in open and amateur heading and healing before producing Super Horse with all probability. When the Gaylord family sold Lazy E Ranch, everyone agreed to let Zanpar Jack live out his life at the longtime home he helped build. Due to infirmities, the stallion was euthanized December 3, 2014, at the age of 35. His disposition was one of willingness and quiet dignity, says Butch Wise, the general manager of Lazy E Ranch and 2019-2020 AQHA First Vice President. Jack was as consistent mentally as any stallion you've been around. He was extremely willing. He always wanted to please. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Zanpar Jack contributed immensely to the American quarter horse industry just as his sire did before him. Now he joins him in the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. On behalf of the Gaylord family, they really wanted me to tell y'all what this meant to them, and they couldn't be here, but, uh, you know, that horse meant a lot to me. Probably the most thing that he meant to me is I was trying to get in the court horse industry. I was a rodeo bum, or a cowboy, or whatever he called me then, and I didn't have no money. And thank God I had Gaylord bought him and hired me to ride him. <laughs> because it let me go back to rodeoing, but that horse produced a lot of world champions for me. Um, probably to me, it's what made him, besides being a great individual himself, all the horses that he produced that uh, helped the industry and the roping industry and the horse industry together, it was, uh, was he was a very unique individual. And as far as Ed Gaylord goes, what a man. You know, he had rodeo companies. He had a lot of things, and uh, we dearly love him. Thank you, guys. Thanks for inducting his horse.
Thank you, JD, and uh, congratulations, Zanpar Jack, as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we go back to the big screen. We now get to honor Bob Avila. He owned a brand new Corvette. He worked at a high paying job, was popular with the ladies, sported a ponytail, and made the most of bright light weekends at Lake Tahoe. For a 20 year old on the cusp of the rest of his life, this guy had it all, wrote Katie Timms in a promotional piece. Then that guy chucked it all to go back to horses. That was Bob Avila, and it was back when the young man began riding horses for Tony Amaral, the well-known hackamore virtuoso who was reinventing the California Vaquero methods of developing reined cow horses. Born in November 1951, Robert Charles Bob Avila grew up with American Quarter Horses at Redwood City near San Francisco, where his dad was a trainer and rodeo cowboy. His mother worked at a western wear store while giving riding lessons to fund her horse show habit. Bob left home after high school to find his own way, but found that way would eventually lead back to horses. Going on his own after three years with Amaral, Bob scored his first major win in 1975 when he rode the Bob Sugar Bars gelding Chug Water to win the senior reigning at the Cow Palace in San Francisco over horses shown by Amaral and other top West Coast trainers. Learning each step along the way, Bob became one of the industry's best known all around horsemen. He has trained a who's who of champions, not only in AQHA, but also the National Reining Horse, National Reined Cow Horse, National Cutting Horse, and other associations. Bob was inducted into the NRCHA Hall of Fame, where he became a million dollar rider while serving on the judges committee and executive board. Bob is a founding member of the AQHA Professional Horseman's Committee, and in 1995 he became the first AQHA Professional Horseman of the Year. Bob has been an AQHA judge for 19 years and on the AQHA Judges Committee since 2009. He also served as an AQHA Director for Oregon for more than 10 years. He and his wife Dana spent 18 years on their ranch at Temecula, California, where they raised, trained, and showed horses. They recently relocated to Scottsdale, Arizona, where they continue to develop and market an extensive line of saddles, tack, and bits. Bob's son, BJ, has become a well-known trainer in his own right, one of many that Bob mentored through the years. A multitude of up-and-coming horsemen, including Todd Bergen, Dwayne Latimer, and John Slack, just to name a few, each worked for Bob before going on to win the NRHA Futurity. Horses have given me everything I have, Bob says. Quarter horses have helped make me what I am. They have been my life's work and I owe them everything. For Bob, it's been a labor of love. I want to be remembered as a horseman, he says. Not as a cutting horseman or a reining horseman or whatever other kind of horse trainer. I get a lot of enjoyment out of picking horses and I think I'm pretty good at it. And I've gotten pretty good at being able to bring that horse along and getting it to do what we want. I've been blessed. It's been a wonderful life. I sure hope I have a few more years, but when I look back on my life, there's absolutely nothing that I would change. A true horseman and asset to the industry, Bob Avila is welcomed to the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Bob Avila to the stage. comfortable on a horse, you know that. Well, I'd like to start with thanking the AQHA, the Hall of Fame committee, and uh, everybody else that had all to do with all this stuff. You know, I've had a long time to think about this because I got notified that I was going to be in here two years ago. <laughs> so uh, I had to work on living this long to get here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when they told me I was going to be in here, I thought about it. And I thought, you know, there's more people that had things to do with this than just me. And I couldn't have done this alone. And, you know, I'd like to mention a couple of them. And one of my good friends, Kurt Heidi, is sitting right down here. He's been my vet for 20 years, and he's taught me how to be a better horseman. You know, he's taught me how to take care of my horses, you know, and 
probably has taught me one of the biggest things is knowing when to quit. Because, you know, horse trainers have a hard time quitting sometimes. You know. So, and you know, my sponsors are really important to me. I've, uh, I couldn't have done it without all my sponsors. Rio and Mercedes, trainer Evan and his wife Karen are here and they have supported me for a long time and it's really been nice. Uh, American Hats, Keith Mundy and Terry are right here with me. And Keith and I have been great friends and his wife Terry, we've gone on vacations together, we've hung out together. It's just more than just a, a sponsorship. Professional Choice has been one of my longest sponsors and I've had them for 31 years. And I'm very proud that my sponsors, I've had long time relationships with. And you know, a lot of things, the people that have worked for me, and they've stayed at home taking care of the horses while I was on the road running around with J.D. Yates most of the time, uh, you know, I couldn't have done all this without them. And I'm very proud of them. I'm probably as proud of them as I am the horses that I've shown. You know, the kids that have worked for me, they've become million dollar riders, they've become fraternity champions. And, you know, I've watched them over the years get themselves in trouble training. And, you know, I've never been the kind of trainer that would say, okay, that's not the way to do that. I'd let them dig a hole and halfway fall in it. And before they drown completely, then I'd jerk them out of there and say, hey, this is what you need to do. But, I, I, you know, that's kind of the way I learned, and I felt that's the way they need to learn. But I'm very proud of all of them. And, you know... My owners have had so much faith in me, and uh, you know they've let me make the decisions on the horses I wanted to ride. They've let me make the decisions on where I wanted to ride them. Ken Banks is right here. He's been a great friend. He's been a customer of mine for 20 years. We've been at each other's weddings. We've been everywhere around the world together, really. So I really I can't say too much about my customers that have let me do what I want to do. And you know, one of the biggest things is the horses I've had. I think a lot of trainers, and I've done this myself, read their own press once in a while and think, oh, I can take that one and I can make chicken stuff out of chicken stuff and make it into chicken salad. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, if you don't have a great horse and have a horse that wants to please you and wants to try for you, you're nothing. I mean, we're nothing without the horses. And, I mean, horses have given me everything in my life, so. And the one last thing is my beautiful wife, Dana. She, she stood behind me all the way. She gets up in the morning with me. We eat together. We go to work together. We go to bed together. And, you know, I know it's been easy on her because I'm really easy to live with. <laughs> but I want to say thank you to her and thank you to everybody else. Appreciate it. Congratulations, Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, we now honor Dwayne Sleepy Gilbreth. Elvis, Ringo, Garth. Everybody knows who you're talking about when you use those first names. In the sport and industry of racing, the fastest horses on earth, it's Jack, Blaine, Bubba, and Sleepy. C. Dwayne Sleepy Gilbreth has built a Hall of Fame career racing American Quarter Horses. I had never really thought about it all that much, Sleepy says. I didn't think it would ever happen, but since it did, I am proud, proud, proud. It means the validation of a whole life's work to me and Joni. I think she and I have stayed hooked pretty good through the years. There aren't enough words to say how much this means to me, my wife, my whole family. I can't thank everyone enough for this. An all-time top 10 leading trainer, Sleepy has conditioned the earners of more than $29 million. He has sent out the winners of more than 40 grade one races in California, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. That includes three in the industry's marquee event, scoring in the All-American Futurity with On a High in 1983, Refrigerator in 1990, and Ochoa in 2011. The most recent, Ochoa, was trained exclusively by Sleepy and is the richest quarter horse in history, with earnings of more than $2.7 million. 
The Trace Sace Gelding is the first horse to win $1 million in consecutive years and the only horse to win the industry's richest race at both two and three years old. His 2012 campaign made Sleepy one of only four trainers to win the All-American Derby with the same horse with which he won the previous year's All-American Futurity and the only trainer to win four runnings of the Derby. Not that Sleepy brags about it. He gives credit to his horses and prefers to let them do the talking for him. Ochoa spoke eloquently. He's a horse anybody could train, Sleepy said before the 2012 Derby. Ochoa's just a fast horse. He trains himself most of the time. With horses like him, anybody could be a good horse trainer. In addition to Refrigerator and Ochoa, Sleepy is the horseman who develop and trains champions Yankee Win, Significant Speed, Cold Cash 123, Foxy Moonflash, and Hot Stepper. Winning races at a career clip of more than 19% since 1970 through January 2019, Sleepy has saddled the winners of more than 1,400 quarter horse races for more than 7,500 starts. He has also sent out more than 2,000 starters that ran second or third in races, meaning that nearly half of the horses that he tacked up in the saddling paddock finished in the win, place, or show column. Together, for more than 50 years, Sleepy and his wife Joni raised daughter Dawn, who with husband Dr. Marty Ivey has daughters Renee, Macy, and Bailey. Already a member of the Rio Doso Downs Racehorse Hall of Fame, Sleepy took home AQHA's 2018 Gordon Crone Special Achievement Award, which recognizes horsemen for their efforts in class both on and off the racetrack. It's safe to say there's never been a more accomplished trainer of racing American quarter horses, says Scott Wells, president and general manager of Remington Park in Oklahoma City and Lone Star Park at Grand Prairie, Texas. Sleepy Gilbreth is in that rare class with Jack Brooks, Blaine Schvonevelt, Bubba Cassio, and Paul Jones. As this great trainer tries to wind down his career, the time for his ultimate recognition has arrived. The accomplished horseman, Sleepy Gilbreth, now joins the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the stage, Mr. Sleepy Gilbreth. First, I'd like to thank the AQHA for this great honor for myself and my family. I'd like to introduce my family, my son-in-law, Dr. Marty Ivey, my daughter, Dawn, <coughs> and my beautiful granddaughters. Renee, Macy, and Bailey. I'm a very blessed man to have this wonderful family by my side. I met my wife, Joni. We were just kids. Her family, her family had some good horses. Joni was a really good hand. They showed horses and rodeoed all over the country. We, <clears throat> we got married with way too young. But we've been together 55 and a half years. <clears throat> For a long time, <clears throat> we struggled doing whatever we could to make a living. Joni's been by my side working at the barn all through these many years. My daughter Dawn, always willing to do 
her part, even taking care of a string of horses at the racetrack. They've both been a big part of my life. I'm very proud of my daughter. She's a wonderful woman and a great mother. <coughs> when I was a kid, we lived in a town in East Texas, a little town, Yannis, Texas. We moved to Dallas when I was in the sixth grade. I'd always had horses, but just horses. After we moved to Dallas, I, I, I went to work for a horseshoe. His name was Don Staples. There's one or two around here that knew him. I worked before school, after school, weekends, summers. He had a few horses. We went all over the country shoeing horses. And I met some great horsemen, great owners. I, 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 didn't, I didn't realize then just, just how lucky I was to be around some of the greatest horses at that time and some of the greatest horsemen. Mr. B.F. Phillips, we shot horses for the Phillips Ranch. B.F.'s brother, A.O. Phillips, had a very nice ranch and we, we shot all his horses. This is when I met Mr. B.F. Phillips. I was, I was still just a kid. And along that, about that time, I met Johnny T.L. Jones, who later, sent me some really good horses to run. I continued to work for Staples and later went out on my own. We moved, we moved to a little bush track in 1970 called Ross Downs, which has some pretty good horse, horsemen stable there, mostly during the winter. In, uh, that's kind of where we got started training for the public. We, in 76, we went to Raton, New Mexico for, for, two, for, for two summers. Did fairly well. We, we run horses in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Colorado, California, New Mexico. I want to thank some people for helping me get started in the early days. And they're here tonight, who stuck with me through, through all of it. I also became great friends. Wilbur Smith, Dr. Gene White, Jack Evans, Jim Helser and Steve Denny. Also, a couple of great guys that I met about that time. They're starting a little magazine, Ben Hudson and Jerry McAdams. That little old magazine did pretty good. Along about 1980, 81, Dr. Jerry Rudisil started sending me some horses, really good horses. Things seemed to go forward from there. In 82, I was asked to <clears throat> train horses at the Phillips Ranch for Mr. Bill Phillips. When we started at the ranch, we were introduced to Dr. Charlie Graham. We have many good memories with these great men. We ran horses at Rio Dosa 40, 41 years. Besides having some really good horses, 
we had some outstanding horses. Absolutely great friends and good owners. My very special thanks to everyone. I'm ending, I just want to say, I've been a very blessed man. It's been a heck of a ride. Thank y'all. Congratulations, Sleepy. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we induct the late George Phillips. In the back of his mind, the late George Phillips was a cowboy, first, last, and forever. A longtime breeder of the American Quarter Horse and past president of the Mississippi Quarter Horse Association, George's life revolved around horses and the pursuit of improving the association. But George was not only a cowboy, after earning a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of Southern Mississippi, George became the youngest U.S. attorney in the nation at the age of 31. He was appointed interim U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Mississippi, where he developed a reputation as a no-nonsense prosecutor who didn't cut corners. Though the usual tenure for a U.S. attorney is three and a half years, George's interim status spanned four presidents, two Republicans, and two Democrats. He finally retired in 1994 as the longest tenured U.S. Attorney. He followed this up with six years of service as special counsel to Mississippi Senator Thad Cochran and was the director of the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics before being named the state's Commissioner of Public Safety. In 2008, he took his final public appointment as the director of the USDA's Mississippi Rural Development Office. Through it all, whether it was with his family, in the White House, or in the courtroom, George was guided by the cowboy way, to be fair and honest. George and his wife Nicole raised three children, Garrison, Margaret, and Mary. After the kids were grown, George and Nicole spent the majority of their time at their home place in Sumrall, Mississippi with their American Quarter Horses. During the heat and humidity of summer in the Magnolia State, they would trailer their horses to Colorado to spend time at their Red Wing Ranch at Silt. They rode out on thousands of acres of BLM land and would help their neighboring ranchers move cattle. George never had a large operation, but the depth of his passion for the American Cord Horse and for AQHA members ranks up there with the top outfits. An AQHA member for more than 30 years, George lived his life as a cowboy, in and out of the saddle. He was first elected as an AQHA director in 2002, serving on the Public Policy and Membership Councils. He was elected to the AQHA Executive Committee in 2011, fulfilling a lifelong dream. I worked for five different presidents, a governor and a U.S. Senator, and I've never been more excited to do anything than to be on the Executive Committee, George told the American Quarter Horse Journal after his election. Unfortunately, George's time on the AQHA Executive Committee was cut short. He passed away on February 2, 2015 from complications of cancer while serving as AQHA First Vice President. George was one of those people who never met a stranger, says Nicole. He was one of those people who, when you met him, you instantly felt like you knew him. He was a great listener, one of those people who could see a problem and go right to the root of it. People could talk for an hour and he could sum it up in a minute. He was the most considerate and consistent person I ever met in my life. He was the same person to everyone at all times. George lived a full life and achieved his dreams of being a cowboy. Now he is a cowboy held in the highest regard as an inductee into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome AQHA past president, Dr. Jim Hurd, accepting on behalf of Mr. George Phillips. Thank you, Jason. It's truly an honor for me to represent George and his family tonight as he is inducted into our AQHA Hall of Fame. George's brother Bud intended to be here but had to pull out at the last minute. 
So I appreciate this opportunity to remember with you our friend George. When I spoke at George's eulogy, I started out by saying George was a Southerner. Those of us from the South know exactly what that means. To us, it's still a compliment. I then went on to say that there's an old Southern term that I thought described George as well as any. That term is, he's a fine man. A fine man is attractive, fun, stylish, and sophisticated. George was all of that. My mother used that term a lot. And she used it to describe a man who was dependable, ambitious, intelligent, personable, polite, fair, likable, and filled with gumption. Those of you who knew George remember that he was all of those qualities. I know that many of you knew George in his role at AQHA, but I don't think you can know George without knowing who he was professionally. George was an amazingly accomplished man, as you just heard on the video. He graduated from Southern Mississippi and went on to graduate from the University of Mississippi School of Law. But unlike many of his fellow classmates, George not only went to school, he worked full time as well. He actually worked in the local tire shop, changing tires all day in the Mississippi heat and humidity. I think this experience stayed with him throughout his life. George always represented the little person. He never forgot his roots. George actually started out his law career in a general law practice as a defense attorney. It didn't take him long to change to the prosecuting side. He said he couldn't stand to represent people that he knew were guilty, but just hadn't been convicted and might not be if they had a good lawyer. So he became a prosecuting attorney in Forest County, Mississippi, the home county of his hometown, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. After two terms, he was appointed as a U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Mississippi. At this time, as the video said, he was the youngest U.S. Attorney in the history of the United States. George was so good at what he did, he actually served under five presidents, and unheard of today in our political environment, served under presidents of both parties. When he stepped down, he'd been the longest serving U.S. Attorney in the history of the Justice Department. I have never known anyone who hated a crook, a drug dealer, a liar, or a scoundrel like George Phillips did. He prosecuted the Southern Mafia, drug cartels, dishonest politicians, hired killers, and civil rights violators. There are actually several TV crime shows that have highlights of his exploits. After that, after he stepped down as U.S. Attorney, he, began, he worked for a while for Thad Cochran. By the way, that was Senator Lott on the picture, not Thad Cochran, uh, for those of you from the South. Uh, and he was uh, Senator Cochran's legal advisor. After that, George retired to spend time on his property in Colorado to ride in the mountains and to be with his friends who were cowboys. He was only able to stay retired for a couple of years until Governor Haley Barber called and asked him to head up the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics. George, again, was phenomenally successful, breaking up drug smuggling rings and arresting drug dealers throughout the state. After his success there, Governor Barber asked him to take over as Mississippi's Commissioner of Public Safety. The Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics, the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation, and the Mississippi Highway Patrol all reported to his office. The unique thing about this appointment was how much the members of these bureaus loved and respected George Phillips. He was one of them. I don't know how many of you know, but anytime you saw George at our convention or anywhere else, he was carrying two guns, and he was the top marksman in all of those bureaus. Shortly after this final appointment, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. George was put in charge of rebuilding Gulfport, Biloxi, and the surrounding communities. He was in the first car to make its way down Highway 49 to the coast. They literally had to stop and cut trees off the highway to get there. For six weeks, he and his men slept under their cars in the August heat and took baths when and if they could. He refused to go to the motel because there weren't enough rooms for he and his men both. He could never talk about those first few days without tears coming to his eyes as he talked about the number of people who died, 
the number of people who were never found, and the animals that were left homeless and without owners. His efforts were considered heroic by the people of Mississippi. I tell you all of this about George's career because it's important to who he was and who he was in our association. As far as AQHA is concerned, George just loved horses and the cowboy lifestyle. In fact, as much as anyone you will ever meet. He really represented the recreational rider. In other words, he represented the over 50% of our membership who loves horses and just wants to ride for fun. I don't know that George ever showed a horse, but he was a three-term president of the Mississippi Quarter Horse Association, leading it to become one of our strongest alliances. For many years, he was show manager of the Dixie National as it became the second largest show in the country. He directed its outstanding trade show and in addition oversaw the judges during the show. If you judged the Dixie National, George picked you up at the airport, he didn't send somebody to get you. He took you to the hotel, picked you up the next morning and took you to the show and then at night took you to a fabulous dinner. If you were with George, whether you were on the EC or just with him as a friend, you were going to eat well. And you always stayed for dessert, sometimes two. <laughs> George was instrumental along with Johnny and Glenn in forming the Animal Welfare Commission. He wanted to make sure that our horses were treated humanely and that our shows and our judging were fair to all exhibitors. His law training was invaluable on the EC. It's been said by some of George's fellow EC members that he had a unique ability to listen to a discussion and thoughtfully get to the bottom of a problem with a common sense solution. In closing, I can't overemphasize how much George loved horses and people, especially young people that needed mentoring, including both of my children. He loved the American Quarter Horse Association and the people of our association. He was happiest riding in the mountains following cattle or riding with his friends. He loved being with horse people. I would give anything tonight if my friend George were here for his induction. Of all of the awards he received in his professional life, he would consider this his greatest honor. Again, I am truly honored to accept this recognition on behalf of George and his family. Thank you. Our last class of 2020 Hall of Fame inductee is the AQHA past president, Mr. Johnny Trotter. Johnny's good friend, Red Stegall, reached out to the foundation once the 2020 Hall of Fame class was announced and wanted to pay a special tribute to Johnny by helping us honor him in this video. Great things can start pretty simple. Johnny Trotter began riding horses as a preschooler in Abilene, Texas, where one of his father's friends had a horse. Johnny's dad was a Methodist minister who, between his son's first and second grade years, moved his family to the Texas panhandle town of Dumas, where another one of his dad's friends would take him to gather cattle. Just before he entered high school, his father transferred to another church and the family relocated to Hereford, Texas, southwest of Amarillo. Hereford was then on its way to proclaiming itself the cattle capital of the world, where today, at any one time, more than a million cattle are fed within a 50-mile radius of town. Johnny Day worked for ranchers and feed yards after school and on weekends. He also shod horses and traded horses out of the sale in Clovis, New Mexico. Four years after graduating from high school, he contracted to take care of cattle turned out on wheat pasture, riding through them to check for those that were sick or injured. One of the ranchers Johnny Day worked for was Shirley Garrison, with whom, in the 1970s, Johnny leased a preconditioning feed yard where weaned calves were started on feed before being turned out on grass and then brought back to the big feed yard. That business today has grown into Bar G Feed Yard, which has a feeding capacity of 120,000 head. Johnny's desire to be a cowboy morphed into so much more. Between being the president and general manager of Bar G Feed Yard and owning or partnering on ranches, cattle, horses, and other businesses, Johnny has experienced the industry from all angles, including qualifying numerous times for the World Series of Team Roping Finals in Las Vegas. In 1998, on a trip to Rio Dosa with then fiance and now wife, Jana, 
His horse interest took a turn towards racing. In 2005, he bred Mr. Jess Perry's champion son, One Famous Eagle, whom he raced in partnership with Burnett Ranches to earn nearly $1.4 million. A leading sire, One Famous Eagle has sired earners of more than $29 million, including world champions One Dashing Eagle and Bodacious Eagle. Johnny owns Bodacious Eagle, who was world champion in 2018, when Johnny was named the AQHA champion owner. In 2017, Johnny, Stan Sigmund, Chicho Flores, and John Andrini bought Rio Doso Downs, the home of the All-American Futurity. It's been a heck of a ride through the horse business for me, Johnny says. I didn't have the money to buy good horses when I was a teenager, so the only way I got to have horses was by going to the Clovis sale, buying two-year-old Bronx that nobody wanted, making horses out of them and reselling them. So not only have horses been a big part of my life, but they have helped me make a living the better part of my life. I've seen things with horses that would break your heart, but I've seen things with horses that are so gratifying you can't explain it to somebody who doesn't have a passion for the horse. Johnny has worked to return the friendship the horse industry has provided him. He was appointed to the AQHA Racing Committee in 2000 and has served on the AQHA Board of Directors and numerous committees and councils. In 2010, after much convincing, he finally agreed to join the AQHA Executive Committee and served as president in 2014. At the end of the day, I want to be remembered as a guy who tried to help and do the very best job for AQHA and the American Quarter Horse that could be done. Johnny says, horses are a passion to me. I'm nearly 70 years old and I can't remember when I didn't want to be around a horse. A lifetime spent dedicated to horses and a legacy that shows a job well done. What began as a desire to be a cowboy leads Johnny Trotter into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome AQHA past president, Mr. Johnny Trotter. Thanks, Jason. I'm humbled to be here tonight, and I want to congratulate the other inductees. And it's the real deal to be put in the Hall of Fame the same night as Dr. Blodgett and Sleepy and Bob. Those guys are horsemen; they know what they're doing, and I'm I'm sure proud to be associated with all of them. I'm not going to take any time to try to introduce everybody that's here in supporting me. Uh, I was looking around before the lights went out. And I've got bankers here and accountants, business partners from several different businesses, employees and spiritual leaders, physicians, professors, congressmen, college president, and so many good friends, I, I just can't believe it. Past and present. Anyway, I want to thank, thank you again for being here. Like the video said, as a, as a little guy, I developed a love for the American Quarter Horse. And as a teenager working with some really good cowboys, horsemen, I became more dependent on them. They've not only been a big part of my life, but they've helped me make a living the better part of my life. They've been real companions, tools of the trade, in the cattle business, in the arena, in the racing and breeding business.
Many of you can identify with the feeling that you get. You go into a training barn, plumb across the United States, call your horse's name out and have him nicker to you. Like here, I'm over here, where you been? It's an incredible feeling, the love of American quarter horse. God's blessed my life with so many friends that were horses. And they've introduced Jana and I to people and relationships with people that I would have never known otherwise and couldn't imagine. Had it not been for a trip to Sunland Park one Sunday and me taking a stand to try to protect our racing quarter horse friends, I probably never would have, even at the request of Frank Mer Merrill, Scoop Vessels, and Steve Stevens, as well as my friend Dr. Charles Graham and Bill Brewer, agreed to serve five years of my life on the executive committee of the AQHA and become the 65th president of the of the American Quarter Horse Association. I appreciated that and I enjoyed serving the AQHA membership. And it was a real privilege to work with Don Treadway and Jackie Payne, Johannes, Orgeldinger, Peter Co. Francisco, Gene Graves, Johnny Dobbs, George, George Phillips, and one of my best friends, Glenn Blodgett. Sandy Arledge and Ralph Seekins. I'm grateful to each one of them and I'm proud that with the help of Micah McKinney and Matt Whitman, we originated the multiple medication violation system that helped establish a benchmark for RCI and the racing commissions. And because of a trip to Brazil to see the Brazilian Quarter Horse Association and with the help of Butch Wise and Vince Ginko, Don and I were able to initiate conversations with the Brazilian Quarter Horse that led to the standardization of a universal stud book and allowed us to exchange uh, drug testing and pedigree information. Now, in the year 2021, as a result of that trip and those conversations, their black type pedigree information is printed on the sale catalogs in 2021. And with the help of Don Treadway and Chad Pierce, we were victorious in the cloning, cloning lawsuit. And we hired Patty Carter and Pete Kyle and Janet Baden Merber. And after Don's retirement announcement, Craig Hubfines. I'd be remiss not to stop just a minute and say thanks to my partner and greatest person in my life, Jana. for her sound advice. <laughs> counsel and support through those five years with AQHA. <laughs> Something else I'm really proud that I could assist with while on EC was helping identify some of the people that, that were worthy Hall of Fame inductees and great horsemen like Ted Wells and Leroy Webb. But actually, after listing a few of these things that we were able to accomplish, and I say we because we were all in it together, 
My greatest accomplishment was, pro I consider, my, great, my biggest accomplishment was probably keeping my buddy J.D. Yates from getting kicked off the professional horseman and out of the association. <laughs> And that's the truth. <laughs> While doing my presidential introduction story in 2014, my friend Jim Jennings asked me how I wanted to be remembered. Brad touched on it a minute ago, but uh, my answer today is as it was then. I would like to be remembered as a horseman and cattleman maybe even a cowboy. But above all, I want to be remembered as a Christian businessman that wanted to do the right thing at the right time. I want to thank everybody that had anything to do with this honor for me and allowing me to join my friends as a member of the AQHA Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Johnny, and thank you for everything you have done and continue to do for the American Quarter Horse Association. We are honored to welcome you into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, that moves us to our class of 2021. Representing the Hall of Fame Class 2021, AQHA Past President, Dr. Glenn Blodgett. We have to put the horse first. That's how AQHA past president Dr. Glenn Blodgett has always done it. Glenn Paul Blodgett grew up in Spearman, Texas, where his father farmed and ranched at the top of the Texas Panhandle. Dr. Blodgett always had a strong interest in animals, and his fondest childhood memory was getting his first horse, Smokey, when he was 10. At the age of 12, Dr. Blodgett started to participate in the family operation more, driving tractors, combines, and later grain trucks, but he always returned to the horses and cattle whenever time allowed. As he grew, his love for horses did too. While in high school, Dr. Blodgett's passion was cultivated as he had the opportunity to work with local veterinarian Dr. Hal Rinker, which helped him settle on a career path to become a veterinarian. After graduation from high school, Dr. Blodgett began working diligently toward his goals. He attended Oklahoma State University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Science. From there, Dr. Blodgett set his sights on Texas A&M University. He graduated from A&M with his veterinary degree and began working at the Spur Veterinary Hospital in Spur, Texas. Two years later, Dr. Blodgett returned to his Spearman, Texas roots to open Hansford County Veterinary Hospital with Dr. Tom Latta. Dr. Blodgett has led the horse division as resident veterinarian on the fabled Four Sixes ranches at Guthrie, Texas since 1982. When it comes to his profession, practice, and passion, Dr. Blodgett deems it best to keep it simple. As a veterinarian, I think one of the things that I can provide perspective on is making the best decisions for the horse and ensuring that we have the highest standards of care for all American Quarter Horses. Dr. Blodgett has overseen the breeding careers of legendary stallions such as Dash for Cash, Special Effort, Streak and Six, Mr. Jess Perry, One Famous Eagle, and Tanqueray Gin. Those stallions are the highlights of a long list of champion racing and performance stallions that made Burnett Ranches an all-time leading breeder, not only of racing and performance horses in AQHA, but also in the National Cutting Horse, National Reining Horse, and National Reined Cow Horse Associations. A member of the Texas Horse Racing Hall of Fame, Dr. Blodgett in 1988 was appointed to the first Texas Horse Racing Commission, where during his tenure, he received the Association of Racing Commissioners International's Joan Pugh Award for Racing Commissioner of the Year. In 2006, he was presented with the American Association of Equine Practitioners Distinguished Life Member Award. Dr. Blodgett was also named the 2017 National Golden Spur Award winner and inducted into the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame in 2019. He also continues to share his knowledge and experience with the next generation. He teaches at Texas A&M University as an adjunct graduate faculty member 
and he mentors between 25 and 30 senior veterinary students each year at the Four Sixes Ranch. Dr. Blodgett has devoted an equal amount of time and energy to the American Quarter Horse Association. He became a director in 1991 and director at large in 2011. He has served on the AQHA Hall of Fame Committee and the Stud Book and Registration Committee, which he chaired for three years. In 2011, he took home the AQHA Racing Council's Special Recognition Award. Dr. Blodgett was elected to the AQHA Executive Committee in 2011 and in 2015 became the 65th person to serve as the association's president. Dr. Blodgett stresses, first and foremost, the welfare of the horse, primarily because it is simply the right thing to do. Additionally, he believes horsemen should know how to care for their horses as opposed to being dictated to by government or other bodies. At the end of the day, Dr. Blodgett's family is of the utmost priority. He has been married to his high school sweetheart, Karen, for 51 years. They have two daughters, Buffy Gines with husband Michael and daughters Catherine, Rebecca, and Claire, and Brandy Mustaine with husband Mike, son Maddox, and daughter Myla. More than anything, he is proudest of his family and wants to continue to be a good husband, father, and grandfather. Dr. Blodgett is an honest, hard-working family man. He has worked tirelessly to improve AQHA and the welfare of the horse. His numerous professional accolades demonstrate his knowledge and his personal convictions display his humanity. A lifetime spent dedicated to horses and helping others leads Dr. Glenn Blodgett into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Welcome AQHA past president, Dr. Glenn Blodgett. Well, <clears throat> here we go. <laughs> As you saw in the video this evening, uh, I've had a passion for horses and cattle all my life and, uh, and all that the Western lifestyle embodies since I was a child. Uh, and I've always wanted to be a cowboy. Uh, it's a great passion of mine. Uh, growing, growing up in Spearman, Texas, as the video said, just north of here, my father had a large farming operation, grain elevator, and seed business, in, in addition to a ranching operation. My, my desires were always to be a horseback and working with the cattle. However, my father, <laughs> he didn't see that way sometimes. Uh, and uh, during wheat harvest, he, I was forced to drive a combine, and that, was, that wasn't one of my favorites. It's something I'll never forget either. But, uh, and every, every chance I got, I, I spent time with our local veterinarian who I had great respect for, Dr. Hal Ranker. And little did I know my passion would shape me in the, into the man uh, I am today. Uh, reflecting on this accolade and other achievements uh, I've been honored to receive over the years, I'm truly humbled to join this prestigious group of men, women, and horses who have significantly impacted the American Quarter Horse AQHA and the equine industry. As I think back, waking up every day and maintaining the highest integrity in everything that I do has helped me be a better person, perform at the high, highest level that I possibly can mentoring young people on the importance of integrity 
and demonstrating how I strive to practice it every day is something I've enjoyed very much throughout my career. I've been very active in the, American, in the association for decades because of the American Quarter Horse is very special to me. Over the years, I've strived to uphold the standards of the association's founding fathers. These horsemen and horsewomen were looking to improve the future of our great horse. And whether they knew it or not, they formed the association in 1940. Their work would never, forever, their work would forever change the equine industry. It was a goal of mine as president in 2015 to learn from the previous 75 years and take necessary steps to ensure that our association would continue to flourish in the future. During my tenure, the ranch has become an industry leader and produce some of the most highly recognized racing and western performance American quarter horses. During that time, I've, I've been asked many times which of our stallions I like the best or which colored horse I like. And my response has always been a good, fast one. Uh, And I, I was asked to mention a few horses, and I mean, it's, that are more special than others, but you know, I, I'd have to say on the Western performance side, uh, Tanker AGN, the horse that I recognized actually before I went to work for the ranch, I bred a personal mare to him down at the Phillips Ranch. And then little did I know what was gonna happen next. Uh, uh, I got hired and, and uh, there Tanker AGN was and, and uh, was fortunate during his breeding career to produce Six's pick, who went on to earn the first AQHA Ranch Versatility World Championship. A broodmare that comes to mind is actually uh, in Six's pick's family on the bottom side, he's grand dam. Um, her name is Natural from our 99 Mare family line which is kind of my favorite on the ranch yeah. Natural uh, the, she's a descendant of Grey Badger the Second, Three Bars Hollywood Gold and Joe Hancock uh, all but one of those horses are Hall of Famers on the racing side, gosh, we I've been associated with a lot of good ones there and they had had some good ones before me as well, but uh, the one that's more special to me probably is Mr. Jess Perry. Uh, I shared his acquisition and syndication stories with y'all at his induction, which were quite a story. Uh, you know, Mr. Jess Perry is a grandson of Streakin' Six, a great grandson of Easy Six, both four sixes, born and bred stallions. Today we stand world champion son of Mr. Jess Perry, one famous eagle. Who is going, who's carrying on the legacy. And I'm real fortunate to have been involved with him as well, with Johnny Trotter. I'm, I'm grateful, you know, to play, played a role in the career of these stands, these legendary stands and mares who, who not only were a blessing for the four sixes, but the entire American quarter horse industry. 
It's hard for me to believe tonight I'm joining some of these horses in the American Court Horse Hall of Fame. So many of you here this evening are business associates, close friends, and family. It's an honor to share this night with you, and it's a, my personal thanks to you, my friends, uh, fellow past presidents, Gene Graves, Johnny Dobbs, my best friend, Johnny Trotter, George Phillips, Sandy Arledge, Ralph Seekins, Jim Hurd, and Stan Weaver. I'd also like to thank past Executive Vice Presidents Don Treadway and his assistant Jackie Payne and Craig Huffines and his assistant Robin Brooks and all the AKHA staff that that worked with me during my years on the executive committee and as president and continue to serve this association. Now, I'd, I'd also like to recognize one person who truly impacted <coughs> my life, who's no longer with us. Mrs. Ann Marion. She had a tremendous impact on my life. You know, she called me sometime in the middle of the latter part of July, 1982, and, and asked if I was interested in going to work for her, managing the horse operation at the Four Sixes. I thanked her and I told her I was interested, but I needed to think about it. <laughs> can, you, can you believe that? Uh, and visit with my wife, and I would call her back in a few days. I think she waited a day, maybe, probably not 24 hours, and called me back. Uh, and that's the way she operated. Anytime I asked her for an opinion or an approval on something, I got a quick answer. Sometimes before I got the question or description out, she would step in and say, wait a minute, let's do it or not do it or whatever. Most of the time it would do it. I don't remember too many knots, but uh, Ms. Marion had a great eye for a horse instead of very high standard. And throughout my career at the Four Sixes, I think she and I shared a vision for continuing and enhancing the legacy of the quarter horse production on the Four Sixes Ranch. And last and certainly not least, I'd like to thank my family. Those who know me well know that I'm a man who lives and breathes the American quarter horse. This horse and the equine industry have not only been my livelihood, but it also helped me raise my children and created for my wife, Karen, and I, a family that goes beyond the bond of blood. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the family members that are here, my wife, Karen, of course, and uh, my daughter, Brandy, and her husband, Mike, and my granddaughter, Mila, and grandson, Maddox. In closing, I'm truly grateful to be inducted in the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame and to join men and women 
who I've considered role models and mentors over the years, in addition to the legendary horses who continue to shape our industry through their offspring. It is my promise to continue to support the American horse, horse industry for years to come, to continue to preserve and protect the horse I love, and I hope each of you join me in that continued effort. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dr. Blongett, and a family man indeed. Of course, a man with a passion for the welfare of the horse and the betterment of the breed shines through the impact that he has made on our association. We are proud to welcome you into the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give one more round of applause for our Hall of Fame inductees and our Merlewood Humanitarian Award winners. Norm, thank you for your help this evening. Not only that, the Amarillo Convention and Visitors Bureau, Amarillo National Bank, Amon Carter Foundation, the Reed Beverage, thank you guys for underwriting this event once again. The videos tonight of these honorees will be available on AQHA's YouTube channel, and we hope that you'll share those videos, your stories with your friends and family. Thank each and every one of you for joining us, and everyone be careful and be safe. <laughs>